I want to thank the organizers, Marcus and Atta, for inviting me to, to present here. Um, it's been very interesting. I've learned a lot, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk. So I'm going to talk a little bit about monetary policy today and hit a little bit on some of the things that we've already been talking about on our panel. Um, and uh, I think Linda said that Peter Kennan, um, professor when we were here as grad students, actually anticipated a lot of this stuff in 1970, I guess, the 1970s. I'm going to go back a little further back and talk about Bog Bogner, okay. <laughs> 1870, the ring cycle. Okay, and so I was sitting in, the, I, was, I went to the ring cycle in 2009. They're actually going to do it again this year. And I was sitting there as, as the, the uh, opera, first opera starts, and I was thinking, man, this is really like, he really anticipated things. So how many opera buffs are here? <laughs> Any opera buffs? Okay, so you probably know the, the story of, of, of the ring and why this is a, a parable and that he anticipated everything. So Votan, you know, head god, he really thinks that he's in a house, the other gods are in it, too small. He really wants to build this really big McMansion called Valhalla. Okay, picture of it there. And that, this is his vision, right? He really wants to move all the gods back into to this nice house. And he has this great idea of this financing this with his builders, who happen to be giants, um, by this big balloon payment at the end. So he can't, he doesn't really have the funds up front, but he, he you know, goes to them and says, look, I can't really pay you now. I don't have the funding, but if you build this for me, I will pay you. I will turn Freya over to you, a goddess. Okay, and you know, you'll get fry and you, know, you can do what you want with her. Um, and so, of course, they, they took it on. And when Valhalla was finished, they built it for him. They came to collect. So Wotan, you know, he, he kind of faced a dilemma because fry was really important to the gods because she tended the apples, right, that gave them eternal youth. So if, if, she gave, if, you know, if they gave up Freya, then they would basically, they would do the demise of the gods because they would eventually die out. So what he does... He goes to the giants and he says, okay, I want to renegotiate the contract. Okay? And I renegotiate the contract, I'll give you some gold. Okay, I'll give you Rhine gold. Okay. So, you know, after some many, many arias and, and much singing, they decide to take, take him up on that. Now, the problem was is that Votan didn't have the Rhine gold. He, uh, he, was trying to, he was using funds he didn't really have. And so what he does is he steals the Rhine gold. He needed the bailout, right? And he steals the Rhine gold, and that bailout causes a whole bunch of unintended consequences that go, go throughout the rest of the, of the 16 hours of opera. Um, and eventually it leads to Guterdammerung, the last opera, which is basically the demise of the gods. The whole source of social order, you know, all the system that we know it fails, okay? So thankfully... Right. I mean, you can see why I think this is basically the this, this story of what we're living through, right? We had overinvestment in housing, we had poor financing arrangements, we had reneging on contracts, we needed the bailout, right? We were funding it with money we didn't have, you know, we had a lot of unintended consequences because of that, um, and, you know, basically the world, you know, collapses. So I think we're in a new world. And I think if you know the opera and the, the ring cycle, what you know is that it's actually a hopeful ending, right? Because even though the, the gods, it's the demise of the gods, it's the rise of the mortals, right? And so the opera ends with basically the mortals then getting, you know, they know they're in charge of their own destiny now. They're, they can't rely on, on the gods to do it. And so, you know, from, there's a lot of people who, you know, are in a new world, right? The people who got thrown out of their jobs, who haven't gotten jobs again, right? They're in a whole new world. A lot of people lost their savings. They're in a whole new world. Um, and so the regulators and the monetary policymakers and the financial, you know, stability, you know, we're all in new worlds too because we're trying to figure out what the financial system should look like post-crisis. And so what I thought I'd talk about today is sort of this new <coughs> world of policy, um, and talk a little bit about the, the uh, monetary policy that we did during the financial crisis and after, and during the Great Recession. There wasn't anything great about it, of course, but we're going to talk a little bit about that. And then we're going to talk about the policy that we're running currently and the current challenges that that policy does. And if I have time, I'm going to talk a little bit, um, as Jean-Pierre did, about um, this sort of nexus between monetary policy and financial policy. So... You know, it, 
the, the crisis really led us into areas that we hadn't really done before. So, you know, if you think about our main policy tool in the Fed is our Fed funds rate, which is the interbank um, interest rate on trading um, from one bank to another, you, an overnight rate. I mean, that's the typical tool that we've used for monetary policy. But the actual first action that the Fed took um, was to, in, in August of 2007, when the financial markets were um, very distressed and high, high stress levels, as we talked about yesterday, and Gary showed some really nice pictures of that, right? We actually lowered the primary credit rate. So this is the rate that when banks are under stress and need funding, they go to the Fed and borrow from. And the idea was to you know, bring that sort of penalty rate down to try to encourage these institutions that were having trouble borrowing in the markets to come to the Fed for money, because there is still a perception of stigma of coming into the Fed and, and borrowing. So that was really the first action. And then we proceeded the next month um, to start bringing down the Fed funds rate. And you can sort of see that here in this orangey line at the bottom. Right? We sort of brought it down from five and a quarter percent in September of 2007 to 2 percent by um, the end of April 2008. And then we paused for a while because it looked like things were stabilizing. Okay? But then the crisis intensified in the fall of that year. And in concerted action with global um, central banks, we then began lowering that Fed funds rate. And we brought it all the way down to ze essentially zero um, at the end in December 2008. And it's been there for over four years now. In addition, right, you can think about the programs, and we talked a little bit about these liquidity programs that the Fed did, sort of as two kinds. One were kind of sort of standard, I think, very much in the vein of lender or last resort functions. So, you know, we lengthened the maturity of the discount window lending. We offered um, credit to primary dealers, which we hadn't done before. Again, we're in a new regime. Right? We talked about the swap, Linda, you talked about the swap arrangements that we made with central banks in Europe. We offered credit by auctioning credit at the discount window, again, as a way to sort of lower the stigma, right? If it's a market price, there's less stigma, supposedly less stigma. Then there was another group of, of facilities that we did which were targeted at what we thought were specific. Oh, I should say, I'm saying we. I'm not talking for the Fed. I, I use that even though I'm can't talk for the Fed. So any, any, I have the same disclaimer as everyone else, that these are my views. Um, and I will try to say the Fed instead of we, but I probably will slip. So we'll all know that we was the Fed in when I'm talking. Anyway, so these targeted programs, right, differed in the kind of collateral and the kind of, of bar, you know, who we were borrowing to, the type of borrower here. But they were aimed at sort of helping particular credit markets that were outside of the the, our realm, which is, you know, co commercial banks. So these are new programs, and we had authority to, to do them. Okay, and I'm, you don't need to look at all this alphabet soup of things, but there were just a bunch of different kinds of programs that were intended to sort of ease up stress in the financial markets, in various sectors of financial markets. And then probably the most controversial um, actions that the Fed took were these programs that helped individual institutions, right? So talk, talked about as bailouts of individual institutions. And these were intended to, you know, there was a lot of fear that, um, you know, there would be a disorderly failure of these and that it would just cascade through the financial system. So that was the rationale behind some of these. Now, Dodd-Frank, of course, altered the authority of the Fed to be able to do these kind of individual programs. Um, so these are kind of off the table um, or uh, in, the, in the new regime that we're living in. Okay. Now, I, t I should also add that as the stress in the financial markets eased up, right, all, you know, these lending programs, right, were all closed down in June of, t of 2010. But nonetheless, if you look at sort of what happened, right, during the recession that ensued, right, this unemployment rate rose, right, it started at 5, it rose up to um, almost to 10 percent, okay, that's a very strong rise. The gray bars here are recessions, right, so you can contrast that. It, it did rise in the 2001 recession, but of course not any nearly as high. And if you look at measures of inflation, the brown 
measure the less volatile one is core inflation, so that gets rid of food and energy prices. You can see that it was running about 2 percent before the crisis, and it's been run and during the recession it came down to about 1 percent. All right. So the damage that was done to the economy then led the Fed to want to do more in terms of monetary stimulus. And that brings us to the policies that the Fed is implementing, actually continuing to implement. And there's been a series of these. Okay, and the reason they had to resort to this kind of new kinds of, of policies, and the two are balance sheet policies and forward guidance, and I'll explain what they are in a minute, was because with the funds rate at zero, you know, you, you don't have any room now to lower rates. So how do you get the real, real rate down? Well, you can do these kind of, you know, or try to do some of these balance sheet programs that, in an attempt to do that. So there were different quantitative easing programs, right? QE1, uh, the Fed purchased agency mortgage-backed securities, and then long-term treasuries um, were added into that. And then there was a second program of additional treasury securities. And these were basically done 2008 through um, uh, 2010. And then the Fed also then put on another program, which was kind of a twist on uh, the QE programs. And in fact, it was a twist, where they basically bought long-term treasuries right, and sold into the market the short-term treasuries. So it wasn't making the balance sheet grow larger but it was sort of swapping maturity to lengthen the maturity of what the Fed was holding in its own portfolio. And then the most recent program that was announced just um, in the fall of last year was an open-ended asset program. So some people call that QE3 in the media, some call it QE <coughs> infinity, because the difference between this program and the other programs was they didn't announce a total volume of assets that they intended to purchase. Right? So in the other programs, they would announce, we're planning to buy X amount, X billion, up to 1.25 trillion of MBS in the first QE after they expanded it. This is basically, they're telling us that they're buying at a flow of 40 billion for MBS and 45 billion for long-term treasuries. And they didn't really tell us what their intended size of that program was going to be. So it's an open-ended pr program. So if you look at this, this is a, uh, a picture, right, that kind of shows the balance sheet of the Fed, right? So above the dark line here, that's the asset side of our portfolio. The bond is the liability side. What you can see is, right, that our portfolio has grown about three-fold since, the, you know, before the crisis, right? We were a little bit under a trillion dollar in assets. Now we're about $3 trillion. And, of course, we don't know when that program is going to end. So if it ends half a year, right, that'll be another half a trillion. If it goes the whole year, it'll be $4 trillion. We just don't have an end point. They haven't told us when it'll end. And right now the reserve balances, which we talked about in the last talk, right, they're at $1.7 trillion. Okay, so that's a big expansion of the balance sheet. But, of course, the other thing that happened with the balance sheet is that the maturity structure of the holdings of the Fed changed, okay? So right now, so if you look at, this is the share of treasury securities with maturities less than a year, we have zero short-term treasuries left on our balance sheet, which is not the way a traditional monetary policy regime, you know, at least in the U.S., has worked, right? We've been, we usually were operating in the short-run part of the market. So the other non-traditional policy that the Fed um, has been using and continues to use, right, is what's called forward guidance, okay? And you can, I don't want you to read all the words, but what you, you can tell is this is about telling the public what its intentions is re relative to interest rates, okay? So in December of 08, basically the Fed said, we think we're going to keep very low interest rates for some time. Okay, so we, they started out with quantitative words telling people kind of what their intention was for policy. And again, it's sort of in the realm of transparency. That would be one reason to do this. And then as time went on, right, we moved from the qualitative way of talking about it to a more um, calendar date way of talking about it. So, you know, the Fed basically said we're going to leave the funds rate, you know, really low at least through mid-2013, and then over time they would change that date, right? So they changed it to late 2014 and then to mid-2015. 
okay? And then they also added, at the, bo at the bottom here, you can see in December, they switched that again, right? And they now are tying the, the forward guidance to actual economic conditions, okay? So that was a big change, and there was a lot of, um, a lot of people didn't like the calendar date because really the calendar date was a substitute for when they thought things were going to improve enough that they could raise the interest rate. And so now it's phrased in terms of the economic conditions that the Fed is consistent with its dual mandate, right, or tied to its goals, right, basically unemployment rates and inflation and inflation expectations. Okay, and in the middle here, they also added a little bit of forward guidance. One, right, this forward guidance here is on the actual asset purchases, right? And this is all they told us about that. It's like, if we don't see substantial improvement in labor markets, we're going to keep buying, okay? They haven't defined what substantial improvement means. And the other thing they told us that even after the recovery starts to strengthen, right, we think that we're going to leave interest rates low, okay? So that's, those are still qualitative ways of sort of giving the, mar the people in the market, the markets, the, uh, you know, the public some information. So. How do these non-traditional policies, how are they intended to work? Okay, so for the large-scale asset purchases, really they're dependent on assets not being perfect substitutes for one another. So it's kind of, it, they call it this portfolio balance channel. So the idea is that, right, if the Fed goes in and buys, right, some of the supply of the long-term assets, then that'll, the people who, in the market who want those, that'll send the prices up in, in long-term rates will come down, right? So price goes up, rates go down. Okay. One thing to remember about that, though, is that as assets become more substitutable, in other words, as financial markets and conditions and transmission mechanisms improve, right, you'd expect the efficacy of this LSAPs to go down because if assets become more substitutable, people don't care as much about what maturity they, they're holding, right? You wouldn't have as big an effect on the, the uh, long end of the market. The other thing that the LSAPs, another way they can work is through what I'm calling here a signaling channel, right? And so you can think of our buying or the Fed buying long-term assets as a commitment device, okay? So how's that work? Well, you're kind of committing uh, that maybe you're going to keep <coughs> policy a little bit weaker for longer Right, than you would have otherwise. But that's a hard, that's, that's such a double-edged sword because we, the Fed doesn't want people to say or think that it's going to be very hard to exit from the policy, yet the way the commitment device works is sort of through that, right? It's a commitment to keep it, you know, more accommodative for longer. So again, you know, trying to control expectations can be difficult. There, there's a, been a bunch of studies that try to look at Right, what are the actual impacts on long rates, and more importantly, the impact on the long treasury, and then the transmission to that to things that, you know, the ultimate goals, unemployment, growth. Um, you know, they, they vary all over the map depending on the methodology used. Um, the, but the one thing I want to show you is if you look at sort of through time, QE1, QE2, and the, and the maturity extension program, or operation twist, the effects have gone down through time as financial market health. Right, and the distress in financial markets has gone down. What about forward guidance? Okay, so forward guidance is kind of interesting. So on the one hand, you could say, like, we know that there's a lot of results in the literature that says if you're transparent about policy, right, if the central bank is transparent about intended policy, then that can reduce uncertainty about future policy and therefore the, the uh, people in the markets, the public, you know, <coughs> consumers, households, can make better informed decisions, right? And that can improve the efficacy of policy. Okay. There are also models where if the Fed or central bank can credibly commit to keeping policy longer, lower, the policy rate lower for longer than a traditional monetary policy rule would tell it to, right, then that can lead to better economic outcomes. In other words, keeping, you know, using a different way of setting policy, not your traditional rule, one that would make the policy rate lower for longer, can actually help. 
how does it work? Well, one, it can temporarily raise expectations about inflation, right? So if people think you're going to keep your rate low, they might think that, ah, oh, inflation's going to be higher, right? That affects basically the real rate today, right? Higher expectations of inflation pushes it down. Well, lower interest rates can spur you to spend, you know, more now rather than waiting till later. Okay, that's an Egerton Woodford kind of story. But in another way, it can work even not with the prices and not the inflation expectations. And that would be if people thought that you're going to keep your policy loose for long, they might think, oh, that means that there might be another boom coming. You know, good times are ahead. I don't need to save as much now because I know my income's going up in the future, and so I'm going to spend now, right? So it's all this sort of shifting expectations, right, by doing something, telling the public about what we intend to do later on, right, that's going to affect expectations today and spending today. So you can affect the current conditions. Now, the real key here is that the public has to believe it's a, a, a commitment and they have to, it's a credible commitment. They have to believe that you're committing to do this. So there's a little bit problem here because the commitment is to a policy that's not time consistent, right? I told you that the Fed or the central bank, whoever's trying to run this policy, is committing to do something that is kind of contrary to what their typical policy will be. So it's going to come time when the economy picks back up. We get to that point, right? Their policy rule would say we should be raising rates, and yet they're supposed to say, no, we're not doing that because we told the public back there, you know, that we're not doing that. We're committed to keeping it loose. So there's, you know, various views about how strong a commitment can a policy committee like the Fed make. Um, you know, and there's sort of political economy views about you have a committee that changes over time and the voting members change over time. Um, but even without that governance issue, there's still this issue about how can you commit to something. So in the models, right, we always can assume commitment, but in the real world, there isn't perfect commitment. And you don't want to run a policy where the public basically then says, okay, inflation's going to be really high in the future. So it's this hard thing. You're really trying to control expectations about inflation will be a little bit high now, but eventually we'll get back to price stability, right? How, you know, comfortable are you that we can actually manage those expectations? Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So these kind of policies, it's not, it's not, um, the Fed understands, the FOMC understands that this is tricky, right? I mean, they don't think that this is a panacea for all their problems. And so if you read the, and of course, I'm sure you all read the FOMC minutes as soon as they come out, right? So at the last meeting, uh, the minutes came out, I think, last week, and there was a discussion in there about, you know, we say in our statement there's pros and cons, or, or that we got to evaluate the benefits and costs. Um, you know, maybe we should talk more about that. And so they said in the last, um, in the minutes that, yeah, we, we'll be discussing the LSAT programs, these purchase programs going forward. So, you know, we've talked a little bit about the potential benefits here, right? If you can lower interest rates now, you may be able to spur growth now. And, you know, there's an idea running around that if you keep unemployment, if it's high for a long time, there's going to be skill loss. And so you might damage, you know, have prolonged damage to the economy because of that. Um, and, you know, if you can keep inflation closer to 2%, which is the Fed's goal, then, you know, that'll help, you know, avoid deflation, which we, would be good. But as I already pointed out, the benefits may be waning over time. So when you do this cost-benefit analysis, you've got to take that into account. There's a number of potential costs. Jean-Pierre, you talked about some of these. Um, and I talked at the break this morning, you know, with, with some people who were very concerned about some of the unintended consequences or the distributional impacts that we may be having by running a very loose policy. You know, we hear from a lot of um, business contacts about excessive risk taking. If you look at M&A activity, it's up. Um, you know that um, retirees have, you know, nothing. They're not gaining a lot on their bank account, and so they may be wanting to take on more risk. Firms are taking it. Banks are taking it. The, the interest rate risk on the bank's portfolio, so that's a problem. 
from the Fed's own point of view, right, it may harm our ability to exit because we've changed sort of our, our balance sheet. And so, you know, there's two schools of thought. There's some people who are worried that we have to rely on these new things like term deposits and interest rates <coughs> on excess reserves. I would think that the harder problem is going to be there may be a lot of political pressures not to exit, right? And so the question is, is the committee going to have the will to exit when it could be very hard um, with, with congressional oversight and, you know, banks and things? So there is this issue about if we wait too long, and we typically have in a lot of cycles waited too long, we may have to raise interest rates quickly, and that could be a problem for the economy. And then there is this thing about, you know, we do remit, do what we do, we do what we do at the Fed, and then we remit, right, anything that we earn on our portfolio back to the Treasury. So there have been studies that look at sort of paths of different interest rate and paths going forward, and given our balance sheet and projections of our balance sheet, that there will be years where we probably won't be remitting money to the Treasury, right? And so one could say that maybe those, there would be no problem with running monetary policy with that, right? But there might be a political risk because if it looks like we're paying interest on excess reserves at a particular rate to banks, we're again paying banks money, we're not paying taxpayers money, right? That has a, a optics, right? that may open up this Fed transparency debate that we went through in Dodd-Frank again. And so that's a risk, I think, for long-run monetary policy because, you know, we, there are many studies that suggest that having an independent central bank that can make policy decisions independent of the fiscal authority is the way you want to do policy. So um, there are a lot of these. I, I, I guess I'm out of time, weren't I? Okay, so I'm not going to talk about the combination, but let me just go to the last slide, that I think this thinking about um, financial stability policy and monetary policy is very important and interesting, but I think we have to be a little bit humble about what we can accomplish um, in the near term because it is, it, we don't even have a model, right, that we can really do to evaluate. We have some models and we're developing them but there really isn't a workhorse model that has a good financial <coughs> sector, multiple interest rates to, to be able to do this. So there's still a lot of work to be done. And uh, thanks for your attention.